In this section, we're going to have a look at fairness throughout the ML life cycle. So obviously we've seen quite a few different dimensions earlier in this course, but now we're going to really focus on the fairness dimension and how we can implement fairness best practices throughout the whole life cycle from ideation of a machine learning problem all the way to deployment and solution. So what we have here in front of us is a typical or an abstract version of a machine learning lifecycle, where usually you would start off with a business problem or a problem, a task that you want to solve, and then that needs to be converted into a machine learning problem. So this would be translating a business goal or a task into something that can be solved using machine learning. And once you're at that point where you have a machine learning problem formulation, you can either go out and collect data or maybe data is already available. There's quite a few things that we can do with that data and we're going to look at each and every one of these sections in just a moment. Assuming now that we've cleaned up the data and we've prepared it and gotten it into the format that we need, we can go ahead and select an algorithm. Once we have the algorithm, we can train and tune the model and eventually we'll also need to evaluate the performance. And then we need to check if what we built, if the model that we built is indeed good enough, if it does meet our business goal or the goal, the task that we want to achieve. And if the answer is yes, well then we would go ahead and deploy the model and start generating answers or predictions for the end user of the model. There's one thing that we need to keep in mind and that is a model can get stale over time, so the world around us does evolve, does change over time, so there will come a point where retraining of the model is necessary. If we get to the point of the model evaluation and we find that the performance is not good enough, we don't meet the goal that we set out to meet, well then we actually need to go back all the way to either the problem formulation itself or we need to go and collect new data, reselect an algorithm, maybe try a different algorithm that would work better, train the model, tune the model, evaluate and check if it's now good enough. So as you can see, this is quite an iterative process and there could be many different versions of models that we try. The question now is where in this life cycle should we consider fairness principles? And the answer is very simple. Well, we should consider fairness principles everywhere. So no matter which part of the pipeline we're working on, whether it's the problem formulation, the model build itself or the deployment, there is always something that we can do to mitigate bias, check for bias and implement best practices on responsible AI. So we should consider fairness principles everywhere. And now we're going to go through the life cycle step by step and really have a look at what specific actions we can take to implement and adhere to the best practices and fairness principles. So when it comes to formulating the business problem, it's all about understanding the use case and the limitations. And this is the responsibility of everyone who's involved in developing the project. So really having a diverse group of thought in this particular step can really help us ensure mitigate bias before it even comes to data collection and model build. So how can we ensure the machine learning problem considers different perspectives? Well, it's all about finding different stakeholders, different backgrounds and diverse groups of thought. Another question that we might want to ask ourselves at this point is whether or not an algorithm is in fact an ethical solution to the problem itself. Maybe there is a simple rule-based system that we could use instead of a machine learning solution, or maybe it needs to be a rule-based system or a machine learning model in combination with a human. So once we get to the data stage, it's all about collecting relevant and high quality data. So you would find a lot of data available out there online, but keep in mind that a lot of it can actually be quite outdated, quite old, so it might not be relevant to the problem at hand. And also you cannot be sure about the quality itself, like what was the standard with which the data was collected, what were the measuring tools, where does the data come from? So you should really look very carefully for metadata on the data set that you plan to use. And in fact, you could even have a look at something called data sheets because that would provide a lot of details and a lot of background on the data set itself. In fact, I would also recommend as a best practice to create a data sheet 
if you have the ability to do so. And then that will ensure that you always know where the data come from, who measured it, when it was collected, where it was collected and so forth. Another thing that we might want to do at this stage is we want to check for sampling issues, for hidden proxy variables, variables that are correlated with sensitive attributes, but that might not look like they are sensitive attributes at first sight. We might want to factor in legal considerations such as licensing, privacy and consent. So you will obviously find a lot of data out there or you could even write your own scraping algorithm. But keep in mind that users and people who put their information out there may not have given consent to use that particular data. So the questions that we're really trying to answer at this stage is, is the training data representative of different groups of different subpopulations? Are there biases in the labels or features present? And does the data need to be modified to mitigate bias? Are there any adjustments that we need to make? Maybe we need to go back out and collect more samples from an underrepresented group, or maybe we just need more information and more metadata about what's going on. When it comes to exploring the data, and we will be doing all of these things later on in more detail as well, it's all about identifying the sensitive features or sensitive attributes and then prepare and process them accordingly. So it might be that we need to transform our data, maybe we need to drop certain columns, and maybe we even need to change and upweigh or resample our data set itself. So once we've dealt with the data itself, and in fact, one important thing that we also need to do at the data stage is to measure the bias that is inherent in the data before it comes to training the model. So at this point now, we can actually go ahead and select the algorithm. And as we saw earlier, there are a lot of different machine learning algorithms out there. They change depending on the different problem types, the different tasks that we want to solve. And some of these algorithms are intrinsically more explainable than others. Some algorithms can be trained and modified in a certain way. So ultimately what we want to do informs the choice of algorithm and what eventually we can proceed with. When it comes to actually training the model, there is a final preparation step that we can take for the data. So this is now referring to specific bias mitigation techniques in the preparation of the data itself, whereas before we were talking about identifying and just exploring the bias. So here now we're actually taking proactive steps and modifying the data according to some fairness constraints or fairness principles. Then we go ahead and we can train the model. And then eventually we obviously need to also evaluate the model. So training and tuning also here, we need to be quite careful that the data sets that we use for training and validation or tuning of the model actually have a correct representation of the different subpopulations as well. And as we'll see later on, there are different techniques that work for different problem types. So for the evaluation itself, we will need to use fairness or bias metrics to determine the quality of the outcomes. And we should include confidence intervals per group. Obviously, the evaluation itself will also have an evaluation for the primary modeling objective, which is the performance of the model itself. So the accuracy or minimizing the error. But really be careful that you always have two measures here. that You have the primary evaluation of the model performance, but then also the fairness or bias measure. So those are equally important and always make sure to have both. Okay, so the question here is then, has the model been evaluated using the relevant fairness metrics? So you can really think about this as a checklist. If you haven't evaluated the modeling outcomes using a fairness metric, well then you should take a step back and re-evaluate using a fairness specific measure. Assuming now that we've met the business goals, so we're actually in the upwards path leading to deployment, I already mentioned that the world around us doesn't remain static. It does actually change. Customer behavior changes. A lot of things can change. So we need to check for what is called model drift. And we should also give out information on how the model is intended to be used. So if you produce a model, uh, 
simple statement about this is the intended use, this is the limitation. You should have actually discussed this in the problem formulation stage. So that can really help limit the misuse of the model. A very simple example of this going wrong is if you were to build a model on one particular region in the world, but then you were to use it globally, well, very likely different populations on the globe will behave differently. So a model built for one region will not work well for another region. And the final point then here on actually creating the predictions or the answers that are being surfaced to the end user, the customer of the model, well, those should have a way of inquiring about the decision that was made. So if we think back to the credit line increase example, if you just provide a denied or approved outcome, the customer will not know why they were approved or denied. So it is actually going to be a whole concept that we need to discuss about explanations for models or using intrinsically explainable models themselves. And this is particularly relevant for high risk use cases. One thing that we do need to be careful about is that the interactions between the different lifecycle components that we have here can also cause unfairness. So just because you mitigated or attempted to mitigate some bias earlier on in the life cycle does not mean that it's completely gone. So careful and make sure that you keep evaluating at every stage of the life cycle itself.